It's Wednesday, May 1st, and I'm your host, Paula Hersey. On Barnstable today, we celebrate our Senior Center volunteers, talk with Barnstable Public School Superintendent, and learn about a new tool to help plan an event on town property. Now, for a look at municipal and legislative news. The Cape Cod Commission will continue its public hearing on Vineyard Winds Cable Connector this Thursday at 3 p.m. at the Commission offices in Barnstable. Vineyard Winds 84 turbine project is planned for 15 miles south of Martha's Vineyard on leased federal land, but the cable laying and new substation will allow the company to deliver wind-generated electricity to the regional grid. The company's new substation is of particular focus of the review due to what appears to be competing goals within the county's regional policy plan. The Barnstable Senior Center honored over 150 volunteers at their annual appreciation luncheon on Friday, April 26th. Volunteering is the ultimate exercise in democracy. You vote in elections once a year, but when you volunteer, you vote every day about the kind of community you want to live in. Author Unknown. Volunteers are more important than a lot of people give them credit for because most senior centers, councils on aging, couldn't deliver nearly the services or the offerings they do without volunteers. Uh, there are over 150 volunteers here in Barnstable that do everything from driving people to medical appointments to helping look at the seniors' needs and where the holes are uh, to be filled for new programs. This day, they're getting their recognition during the senior annual luncheon. And short as it might be, uh, you have a a group that is willing to give back to the community and in, in their joy and humility in doing this of providing a silent service that's not normally recognized or seen. Uh, we should do more for them because they do so much for us. Today is a great opportunity for us at the Senior Center to be able to celebrate the collective contributions of all of our volunteers and we're extremely fortunate here to have a huge um, team of volunteers that assist us in so many different ways whether it's driving our vans or helping out at the front desk or helping with our newsletter mailing or the um, you know the volunteers that serve on our Council on Aging and Friends of the Council on Aging boards, um, our craft group. So. You know, we get to work with all of those volunteers individually, but the volunteer recognition event is an opportunity to collectively bring all our volunteers together. So we can really recognize um, their contributions. And, you know, we're, we have currently about 170 volunteers um, that are helping us in, in various capacities. And for us to be able to talk to the volunteers collectively about that impact, um, you know, and the fact that they contribute over 6,000 hours of service a year is really significant to us in the terms of you know in terms of us being able to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our community and that it's not something we could do just through the staff um, so our volunteers are an essential part of what we do and, um, and and how we serve our community and we're just extremely blessed to be able to have them come in here and honor them together so people are always looking to do more and it's you know, to their own social benefit, they do that. They're making friends, they're staying young and uh, healthy, and they're, they're keeping their uh, wits about them every day without being isolated. That's some of the benefits that you don't see. Well, one of, when we ask people, you know, what, what it means for them to participate here, it's all about connection. And I think, you know, in terms of people aging well, and most of our volunteers are people that have retired from their professional careers, but understand the importance of having a sense of purpose and staying engaged in the community and how that contributes to healthy and successful aging. So I think the fact that, you know, they're still so engaged in our community in so many ways, um, that civic engagement part is really important because it's sort of this you know they're better than the sum of their parts when they work together and really you know when you know our volunteers are doing their you know duties whether it's driving um, or helping with our brown bag program or whatever way it may be there isn't always that opportunity for them to interact and this event is important because it really gets them to see the totality you know of what they do and how they help and you know really the importance of friendships and connection as well because you know when we bring people together that's what happens as a result and that's always a good thing for here I'm glad for the opportunity to give back. Uh, 
without stating my age, which is not important, I've had several decades of experience on this earth, and here is a chance for me to share some of that and give back to the community. You know, I just think for us, you know, I think I speak for the staff, when it's this huge sense of inspiration that we draw from the volunteers because every day we get to engage with them and really, you know, learn from their experiences. So I think for us it's the sense of gratification and reward. It's very humbling for us to be able to thank our volunteers and honor them um, and really impart to them that we wouldn't be who we are, you know, without them and that I really truly believe that we're better because of them, you know, and they teach us all a lesson every day. Superintendent Meg Mayo Brown and school committee member Barbara Dunn share some updates on the new district innovation school and the community partnerships initiative. Can we believe it? The school year is almost done. Just a few months left with me today, Superintendent Meg Mayo Brown and School Committee Member Barbara Dunn. It's April. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Finally. Mm -hmm. uh, we have senioritis. Um, we definitely that's do. <laughs> definitely going on at this point in time. Yeah. We have some spring weather, so those classrooms are going to get a little ants antsy, but some of the outdoor programs will start. Yep, but exactly. let's start with a change uh, with from charter school to innovation school. It's happened. It has, and um, I was fortunate enough to serve on the committee as that application was written and put together. And it's a group of dedicated staff um, that have done a phenomenal job putting together the plan, and we're really excited about it. So you had an open house uh, so people could kind of ask questions of what the changes were from Correct. the charter to the innovation and, and what was people's uh, perceptions of that? Right. Um, I think they actually had two open houses. I went this week and um, they had student ambassadors giving a tour of the building. They had some video clips um, as you come in to watch just what's going on in the school. Um, and it's really exciting. There's a really upbeat attitude about the upcoming changes and um, it was fun to chat with the students a little bit. And They're yeah. always fun. Yeah. <laughs> Half the battle of, yeah. of being in school is to listen to the little ones. We had a chance to see some uh, Centerville Elementary uh, students this past week and it renews your sense, uh, sense of faith in humanity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Superintendent, talk a little bit about the changes of bringing in an innovation school into the district. It's it's. Sure. The first, obviously, there's only, I believe, one other on the Cape. What's your feelings of how this is integrating? So, first of all, um, for your viewers, we want to be sure that they know that the school committee, you know, formally adopted the school as an innovation school. We now need to, as of July 1, refer to it as Barnstable Community Innovation School. It remains a school of choice, will serve all seven villages. Um, parents can apply for enrollment. Um, I don't think that folks will see much of a difference between what it was as a Horace Mann school and now what it is as an innovation. So part of what the educators and staff were doing as a, as a Horace Mann charter school, they had autonomy around curriculum, instruction, professional development. Um, the group of educators that came together to make the application to the school committee said, you know what, we're getting great results with kids. Um, with those autonomies. We'd really like to continue those autonomies. So that work um, that's really driven by the educators of the school will remain and continue um, to go. So that's the innovation component right. of it. They've also added a project-based learning um, element to the work that they're doing and that's new and that's the real innovative work um, that they're embarking upon in terms of making sure that students have an opportunity for interdisciplinary project-based learning. Um, in the budget we've put in for the school committee to consider a project-based learning coach for the school that will help educators um, integrate project-based learning into their daily instruction. So we're super excited about um, what they're about, re they're getting ready to do there. This is, it's, it's exciting news. Um, you know, I know that there was uh, some feelings that this was going to change a little bit, but it really isn't. This school will remain a true community school. Absolutely, and I think, you know, what the significant change is the governance model. Right. So rather than being governed by a board of trustees with ultimate oversight by the State Board of Education, the local school committee now has oversight of the school. Right, so a little bit more uh, oversight on the school committee's part, and the school right. committee is, is ready for this. Absolutely, and I think it feels more unifying as a district to have us all um, working together as a group rather than 
some separation there. And um, I think, as Meg was saying, the great thing about it is there's not going to be as much change as people might have anticipated. It's actually going to be very similar mm -hmm. with just some added positives to the already great things they're doing. So. And talking about working together as a group, um, one of the biggest things that we've noticed uh, with the schools is partnerships, community partnerships. So there's a lot out there that people can do to um, really be involved in their community and their schools. There's a, uh, I'm not sure if it's called an advisory board or, or a board that looks at community partnerships. Tell us a little bit about that. Right, so we created a subcommittee of the school committee right. and we've pulled, one of the district objectives is to grow community partnerships um, to further support uh, social, emotional, and academic learning of students. So we put together this great group of people. It's about half um, staff and district people, and the other half are just various community members. And um, we've actually connected as a resource with Falmouth has an incredible program called VIPS Volunteers in Public Schools. And Tracy Crago is the director of that, and she's been really generous in giving us a lot of her time to share what they've already created. Um, so we're kind of looking to her for some guidance and just to better structure. There's a lot of great things at the high school. Um, some schools like High West already have established a lot of partnerships, but not it's not equitable equitable throughout the district and it just there's so much more to be done so All right talk a little bit about the importance of community partnerships in our school we always think that it's you know strictly academics or maybe sports but bringing in business members and other people of the community really is important we have such a wealth of resources in Barnstable and we want to be sure that our students are connecting with those resources and but that, that it's a reciprocal relationship that you know that we um, want to be open in terms of bringing the community into schools because it's just not as you're saying it's just not about academics there's so much more to schooling um, you know we've uh, the committee has you know has a focus on academic social emotional learning as Barbara was saying um, community partnerships so we're working with all three uh, objectives to make sure that it aligns with our uh, vision of really educating the whole child. And I think, again, that community emphasis and bringing community um, you know, resources into schools and getting our kids out to those community resources just benefits everyone. Right. So Barbara, Absolutely. talk a little bit about how this can kind of coalesce and come together. There has to be some type of management of this. You know, I, I having been a volunteer and, and a volunteer manager, uh, we run amok very quickly if we don't have a central uh, kind of place that we can gather and, and get information. Right. So how will that work? So we started, the district started the ball rolling and creating a family engagement center. Um, with potentially um, someone to be hired to um, oversee that and under that large umbrella which will include components of school registration kind of a go-to place for people parents in the district who want information or need direction who to talk to under that larger umbrella would come um, working to build community partnerships and so assuming we are able to bring someone on board they would work and the committee would have input I'm sure too to work on growing those partnerships. Right and let's talk a little bit about bringing somebody on board mm -hmm. is this something that is budgeted for? Yes it's um, it's a budget request the school committee will hear that at their budget uh, meeting and there'll be a public hearing obviously as a component of that meeting you know, I do want to say that um, our town manager, Mark Ells, is always hugely supportive of the schools and um, we've worked with him in partnership to identify a space at the Hyannis Youth and Community Center where we can have our family and um, community engagement center run right out of there because there's so many resources at HYCC, right? It makes perfect sense to um, have us housed there. So um, pending the school committee approval, we'll post the position for a family and community engagement coordinator. Uh, and then hopefully move forward by July 1st. So uh, this position itself to me sounds like a perfect opportunity, like you said, for a one stop for parents' questions um, and then being able to bring in, having it housed at HYCC mm -hmm. where a lot of businesses already support teams and things like that is a perfect marriage to, to develop and those partnerships yeah, as well. 
Um, one of the things we're looking to, um, with again the guidance of Tracy Crago, who's already been through this process, is to do some focus groups as we move forward to get input from parents, staff in the district, community members as to how they view um, what they could best help with and support and give us ideas, kind of a reciprocal give and take to know how we can best structure this to get the most input. Right. And having so many different entities out there as partnerships, um, we talk about the social emotional learning and one of the things that I learned from Dr. Hurley is that this particular uh, in a, uh, initiative from the schools is really to prepare our children for real world things that they're going to experience in the job place. So, you know, it may start in kindergarten, but mm -hmm. by the time they graduate high school, the whole child is, sure. is ready for citizen's work. Right, right. And that, um, you know, what we hear from employers on the Cape is that they need graduates who are able to work well with others, to be part of a team, to have responsible decision making. You know, so we're working on all of those skills, K through 12, in the school system to again build that so those social emotional competencies, as we call them. So that's different from behaviors, right? Because often we hear people talk about behaviors, but what we're talking about when we say social emotional learning, it is that whole child development so that our students upon graduation are prepared for college, career, you know, whatever the whatever avenue they'd like to take. That's great. I know we have I an intern from uh, Barnesville High School yeah. who's very well adjusted. Uh, <laughs> 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 One of the things I'd like to close with is as we get closer to the end of the school year, what are some of the focuses? Obviously, you've got budget coming up for school. Mm -hmm. um, you've written the budget, now it's getting through the public hearings, but what should parents in, in the, the community be aware of as we start to, that final stretch into May and June? So that final stretch for us really is about preparing for an opening for next, for September, right? This is the work that right. um, we do. But really the message for families and for students um, is to con you know finish the year strong. You talked about senioritis. I have a senior at home. It's getting very <laughs> challenging to continue to engage and motivate. So you know to the extent that we can continue to engage our students through these final months of school. Um, and certainly we can't emphasize enough around the importance of reading and literacy and promoting that at home and you know certainly we're promoting that at school but to continue you know our message to, to students is finish the year strong and to parents we know that can be challenging and uh, and we're with you on it right. and yeah. most of your big work is coming up as as the budget's unveiled and there's right. a lot of details in that what's right. up for the school committee for the next couple of months yeah, we've already, uh, the last couple meetings, have started that process of having the budget um, discussed at our meetings, and that will continue. The final vote on the budget is? April 3rd. April 3rd, yeah. yep. So yeah. we've been already at our public meetings having discussion around it, and um, I think we're very fortunate to work so closely with the town mm -hmm. on the issues and have such a joint, um, goal of what's best for the kids and what's best for the citizens in our town and I think um, so I think we head into that budget process already so far ahead of the game that it feels pretty positive. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Special events on town property just got easier to facilitate. Assistant Director of Planning and Development, Liz Hartsgrove, shares information on an easy-to-use website to plan your event. Special events means summer is right around the corner with me today. Liz Hartsgrove, you've got all sorts of new things happening with special events. Started last year with the special event guide, which was a big hit. It yeah. helped people kind of figure out the maze through Town Hall. Yeah. Uh, to get an event going. So let's get an update. What's going on? Yeah, the town manager did task planning and development to be in charge with streamlining special events and how do people, organizers, actually go through, like you said, the process and, and wiggle their way around town hall and not feel um, the wa weighted by it all. And so the guidebook, like you said, total success. It's been really fabulous. And 
Um, and we also in, um, incorporated beer and wine on three separate locations in, in Hyannis area, the, the Town Green, Asselton Park, and the Hyannis Harbor Overlook, where the three new shanties are located. Um, but yes, since June, um, we have been making good strides on trying to increase all of that um, awareness and perception and, and access to information. So, um, so now we have a website and a lot of online goodies that people can actually look from the comfort of their home and apply from the comfort of their home. Um, so yeah, so that's it's a big thing coming up. I'm excited. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about special events. It's not that you can have your retirement 50th <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> party on the town green, but the special events are for larger, sometimes larger organizations or uh, established uh, uh, types of events that are out there. So yep. give folks a sense of what we're talking about here. Well, actually. We do incorporate 50 <laughs> anniversaries or parties and stuff. We do from small family gatherings all the way up to the very large 10,000 um, attendees type of events, like the um, you know happens on the green. Right. So um, yeah, so we have we accommodate any size, um, but what they do is they can go online now and we have a on-town property calendar that people can go see what events are actually scheduled and then they can pr plan accordingly and make adjustments to where they want to hold events. If, for example, if the town green is already occupied and scheduled for that particular weekend that they want to have an event, they can look at alternative locations, possibly Asselton Park or other outside, even any of the other seven villages, I mean six mm -hmm. villages besides Hyannis. Um, there's a lot of opportunities out there for, to enhance your event with the complements of our, our locations. So. Right. What do people need to kind of understand about these uh, other villages? Mm -hmm. um, some of these properties fall under a different purview yeah. than you would think. So, you know, for example, Sandy Neck. Yeah. Sandy Neck um, and the airport or the adult community center that was the former senior center, right. um, HYCC, the golf facilities, um, any of those, even the high arts um, campus, the cultural right. campus. Uh, those facilities are designated by the individual departments that the town manager has actually designated to be in control of. And those are particular, um, they have different nuances that each department needs to make sure that they can have a firm handle on. And so they have different forms, they have different things. This new website provides those links automatically so then somebody can actually choose, okay, I want to um, I want to actually have a fishing tournament at Lake Waquocket. So, and there's a link and they can click on it, it'll bring them over to the MEA department and then to the right contact information. Um, or Sandy Neck, that they can go and again be um, directed over to the Sandy Neck website and then they right. can obtain their wedding permit or a beach party type of thing. So. But sometimes the first stop is just with you. Yeah, so this website, again, is going to provide all that information. And right. if they have any questions further down um, for the other, all other properties, they'll provide the guidebook. It provides all that information. And then down at the bottom, for any particular questions about any town property, they should actually come to me. I can actually help them through the process, direct them to the exact person, rather than have them feel like they're on a merry-go-round going and being shifted right. to between departments. So. What are some of the things that um, people should keep in mind about scheduling or trying to schedule an event on town property? Yeah, my, my first suggestion is looking at that town calendar. And right. um, the calendar is mobile friendly, which is really excellent. And um, and then they can see and plan accordingly. And, and we accept applications up to a year in advance. So some of those annual events that we have, uh, the really large ones, the day after their event, they are submitting applications to reserve for the following year. So we are our Already well in advance that people can see um, and adjust like I said and then what they can do is now we have an online application so everything can be done they can start the application they can actually save it and come back later on so um, they can stop and ask you know contact me ask questions about the application 
but, um, but then they can submit online and they can also include attachments. In the website, we include site plans of the more frequent used locations, so then they can use the same map and, and identify where tents are going to go, all the enhancements, where the food is going to be served, where the entertainment's going to be, where the alcohol, or even a petting zoo. You know, yeah. all of those things are things that we need to see what happens on the property so we can make sure that we are giving them the right guidance of where it would be best suited for their event and the size of it or the attendance or who the attendees are. That all yeah. plays into it. So Okay. Any other like advice that you want to give people before we wrap up? Just come talk to me. <laughs> I think it's really, I'm the one-stop shop for it. You know, I'm, I'm the, uh, the call center for special events and um, planning and development is, is going to be, you know, moving forward even faster. We're going to be accepting online payments. We're going to be doing a lot of different things and, and so just stay tuned, really. <laughs> What's that phone number? My phone number is 508-862-4068. Excellent. Thanks so much, Liz. Thanks, Paula. Happy summer. You too. Up next, things to do, places to go, and people to meet. The Cape Cod Technology Council's Earth Tech Expo on Saturday, May 4th, will include workshops from the Cape's leading minds in green energy, as well as exhibits that highlight local businesses and organizations making a difference. The event is scheduled from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at Cape Space, located 100 Independence Drive, Hyannis. And it's a free event. For more information on workshops and exhibitors, www.earthtechexpo.com. Comments, suggestions, accolades? Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Email us or send us an old-fashioned note by Carrier Pigeon. Channel 18 works for you. I'm Paula Hersey, and thank you for watching Barnstable today. Music